their life beyond the grave. If the soul exists, does it survive the body? For thousands of years, the question has haunted the human imagination. Is death the end, or do we live again? It has probably happened to many of us at some time or another. It is called deja vu. Suddenly, in an area never before visited, there is an indefinable feeling of familiarity. In some mysterious way, there is a sense that you have been here before. Could this be possible? What about the person with whom you have chosen to share your life? Have you known one another before, perhaps, as some believe, in a previous life? The human mind has grappled with the notion of reincarnation for millennia. In some cultures, the idea was seen as a threat, warning of dire consequences for an unjust and dishonest life. Might evil deeds committed in a present life lead to reincarnation on a lower level, such as an animal or an insect? On the other hand, would a life of merit promise rewards in the next incarnation? Is belief in reincarnation as old as humanity's faith in a divine force that creates and judges the world? The overwhelming majority of the Earth's inhabitants believe in life after death. But a sizable proportion also clings to the notion that the soul is not simply destined for heaven or hell, but returns to life in another physical body. Many people feel that reincarnation can't exist because they don't remember their past. And my answer to the world is we do remember. We don't have the details, but we have certain key hints as to who we are, the type of music we like, the people we're most attracted to, the types of food we like, the clothing we wear, certain periods in history that we identify with. These are indications this is where we have been before. And so our present incarnation or our present lifetime is a composite of all the fruits of what we were before. To discover the origin of the concept of reincarnation, we must embark on a quest deep into antiquity, for the ancient world holds intriguing clues to the earliest stirrings of the idea that life may indeed transcend death. It is a belief that may date back to the Stone Age. Tens of thousands of years ago, many primitive societies buried their dead in a fetal position. Perhaps this suggests a belief in reincarnation in which the deceased was being made ready for rebirth. Today, India remains one of the most vital links with the ancient past. Here, Hinduism is the predominant pathway of faith. At least five to six thousand years old, much of its origins remain a mystery but it is the oldest known religion still practiced anywhere in the world today. Acceptance of reincarnation is central to Hinduism. A person's rebirth in a new physical body is believed to be a direct result of how one lived in a previous life. Escaping the endless cycle of birth and rebirth is fundamental to followers of the faith. The process is known as karma. The ultimate aim is to break the cycle, to allow the soul to return to its maker, thus avoiding further reincarnations. You escape it according to the theory. 
when you completely overcome your egotistical desires, when you become compassionate, when your heart opens up to the whole world, and when you are ready to join your maker. That's when you uh, escape the wheel of samsara, as the Hindus say. But as long as we have desires, we'll come back time and again to satisfy them. Or as long as we have karma to, uh, uh, to pay, the law of cause and effect will bring us down until our soul matures to that state where it has no longer any reason to come back to this world. Among the Hindus, the cow has long been held sacred. Is there a conviction that animals have souls too? If so, do they also conform to the laws of karma, to the cycle of birth and rebirth? And in Hinduism, you can be reborn from human to animal to even lower forms. It, it all depends on the actions that you perform in the life. You can go up or down. You could be reborn at a lower form, or you could be reborn as a god. Of all the religions in the East, none adhere more strongly than Jainism to the belief that everything in the world undergoes a process of reincarnation. In Jainism, we find that uh, the notion of the soul appears not just in humans, but in literally everything that exists, in animals, in plants, in uh, what they call organisms, microorganisms, even in rocks and stones. The soul can progress from form to form. However, the human body is the one body in which souls can become liberated. So committed are the Jains to a belief in reincarnation that to avoid destroying even the most insignificant creature, many of them wear face masks to avoid ingesting the tiniest of insects. Insects which, to the Jains, may once have been human. If they are responsible for taking the life of another being, they believe they will reincarnate again to pay a debt for their sin. In neighboring Tibet, Buddhism, originally from India, has been the national religion for some 1400 years. One of the central texts of Tibetan Buddhism is the Book of the Dead. Once a person has died, a lama or priest will read passages from the book to help a deceased soul choose new parents and a suitable environment for his or her next incarnation. The prayers are intended as a guide to help the soul prepare for a new life in accordance with the deeds and accomplishments of the life just ended. Nowhere does this belief carry such importance as with the selection of the Tibetan Buddhist spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama. Ever since 1694, all Dalai Lamas have lived in the Potala Palace, overlooking the city of Lhasa. In 1959, when Communist China invaded Tibet and imposed military rule, the current Dalai Lama fled his capital and settled in India. In exile, he continues to perform the function of religious head of millions of Asian Buddhists. But how did he come to occupy this revered and sacred role? When the 13th Dalai Lama died in 1933, Religious leaders immediately began a search to find his successor. But he had to be a reincarnation of all of his predecessors. How was he to be identified? The usual procedure is that the old Dalai Lama, before he gets near to dying, and usually they know when they're going to die, they sort of write some letters or they leave a testament or they give some clues to their, their people and say, gee, I really like that area, I like that town, I like that family. 
But they take those clues into account. Then, uh, after they die, all the local psychics, you know, the Gene Dixons of Tibet, the professional psychics and astrologers are all consulted. And then they say, well, I think he's in the Northeast, and I think he lives in this kind of a house and this kind of a family. Deep in the hills of Qinghai, in China's remote western province, a young boy by the name of Lamo Dondrub was born to a poor peasant family in 1935. But this was no ordinary child. From his earliest years, he was different from other children, often even fantasizing that he would one day travel to Lhasa in Tibet, a place neither he nor his family had ever visited. When I was very young, I think two, uh, one and a half years, or the two years, uh, three years, you see, during that period, I always was uh, telling my mother, uh, I, I will go to uh, Lhasa. That, and also uh, whenever I play, and also I play, now I'm, 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 uh, uh, going, going so there. I, I'm, I'm now moving. News of the young Lamo Dondrub soon reached Lhasa. In 1937, a search party of disguised high lamas from the Tibetan government set out for the tiny village to investigate the two and a half year old boy that they had heard about to discover if he could possibly be the reincarnated Dalai Lama. Asked to pick out artifacts of clothing and religious objects that belonged to the previous Dalai Lama from an array of similar objects, the young boy unhesitatingly chose every item correctly. At one point, he reached out for the Dalai Lama's rosary and claimed that it was once his own. Lama Dondru was then subjected to a physical examination in which his body was inspected for certain marks traditionally associated with Dalai Lamas. These included large ears, upward curving eyebrows, moles in certain locations of the torso, and a palm print resembling the design of a conch shell. Without exception, each telltale sign was there. The reincarnated 14th Dalai Lama had been found. Today, the Dalai Lama is revered by Buddhists everywhere. He is not only the leader of one of the world's great religions, but accepted by his followers as the reincarnation of all 13 previous Dalai Lamas. Western belief in the rebirth of the soul may already have been well established by the time of the ancient Egyptians. Pharaoh Amenhemhat I of the 12th dynasty ruled a country during the period known as the Middle Kingdom, some 4,500 years ago. According to some scholars, he was popularly known as he who repeats his births, giving us insight into the possible widespread acceptance that the Pharaoh lived on after death. The Greeks and Romans attributed belief in reincarnation to an Egyptian mystic known as Toth Hermes. The soul passes from form to form, from level to level, and the mansions of its pilgrimage are many. Thou mortals puttest off thy bodies as raiments, yet thou art from old, O soul of man. Thy soul art everlasting. Toth Hermes. Toth Hermes remains one of the most mysterious figures in all antiquity. Was he a human, a god, or a being of legend? He is sometimes depicted as the ibis-headed god of wisdom, justice, and writing. Whoever he was, he was to leave an indelible mark on Western culture. Some scholars believe that if Toth Hermes was indeed human, he may have been the original author of what is known as the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Found in many tombs and crypts, 
The hieroglyphs and art that constitute this mysterious document often depict the soul as a human-headed bird called the Ba. After 3,000 years of reincarnating as plants or animals, some believe the soul eventually would earn its right to be reborn in human form. Let me have possession of my Ba soul and of my spirit, wherever it may be. Observe thee, my soul, O guardians of heaven. Cause my Ba soul to find my body. The chapter of making the soul join its body, the Book of the Dead. During ancient times, it was in Greece that belief in reincarnation eventually became widespread, and at no time more so than when Greek civilization was at its classical zenith. The goddess Psyche was reputed to have been one of the loveliest beings in the entire Greek pantheon of deities. Her beauty was so remarkable that the name Psyche was also used to describe one of nature's most magnificent creations, the butterfly. But because the butterfly was born of a lowlier form of life, the caterpillar, the Greeks had yet another meaning for the word. Psyche also meant soul representing the ability of a creature's spirit to migrate from a lower order of existence to a higher, more perfect one. The Greeks saw great symbolism in the transition. It is intuitively natural to the human being to assume continuity in everything. In other words, if you look around the universe, there is nothing that you can find in the universe that does not demonstrate continuity. When uh, wood burns, it becomes ashes and heat. When uh, water flows, it goes somewhere. You know, when water boils, it becomes steam. In other words, in every natural process, we observe continuity. And therefore, it is unnatural that our consciousness alone, or our soul, our deepest level of consciousness, would be the one thing in the universe that would not have continuity. One of the most ardent Greek believers in reincarnation was the great philosopher Pythagoras. As a mathematician, his name would be forever inscribed in the annals of history. The school that he established at Croton on the mainland of Italy taught mathematics, astronomy, music, and architecture. Pythagoras was not only a gifted and original thinker, but he was said to have had mystical insight into the nature and origin of life. He claimed to have lived many times. It was believed that Hermes, the god of science and innovation, had imbued him with the vision to see all his previous incarnations. Pythagoras' students were well-versed in the mysteries of reincarnation and were encouraged to value life. They were taught to respect the soul of all beings, refraining from killing any animal and adhering to a strict vegetarian diet. Though a teacher, Pythagoras left no writings. However, his belief in reincarnation was expounded by three of the greatest Greek philosophers who studied his teachings, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Must not all things at last be swallowed up in death? Yea, but I am confident that there truly is such a thing as living again, and that the living spring from the dead. The souls of the dead are once again in existence. Socrates, 450 BCE. Though the physical resurrection of the human soul was proclaimed by some of the most admired minds in Western civilization, for centuries belief in reincarnation was either suppressed or simply lay dormant.
The concept that the human soul experiences multiple births and rebirths may seem alien to Western thinking, yet some believe that one of the most dramatic examples of a reference to reincarnation is found in a text with which many of us are familiar, the Holy Bible. One of the oldest examples comes from the book of Exodus. Led by Moses, the people of Israel are at the foot of Mount Sinai. Here, following God's orders, Moses delivers the Ten Commandments to them. When he reads the Fourth and Fifth Commandments from the tablets supposedly written by the finger of God, the people hear these words. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Exodus 20, 4. This has created a lot of questions for a lot of people. What can that possibly mean? Reincarnationists believe that retranslate generation to incarnation. So the sins of the fathers will be visited upon the third and the fourth incarnations. In other words, the soul will come back and the sins that that soul in that former life experienced or committed will then have to be dealt with in a karmic sense later on in the third and the fourth generation. Another example of a passage that may refer to reincarnation in the Old Testament comes from the book of Psalms. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Psalms 93. One interpretation of this passage comes from ancient Jewish mystics who believe that there were thousand-year cycles between the physical incarnations of the human soul. One of the most mysterious traditions of Judaism is an ancient body of mystical beliefs known as the Kabbalah, a Hebrew word meaning to receive. The basis of Kabbalah is believed to have been given originally by God to Moses on Mount Sinai, then secretly passed down from generation to generation. The central book of Kabbalistic study is the Zohar, meaning splendor. It is a lengthy commentary on mankind's relationship with the Supreme Being, on reincarnation, and on the nature of the soul. There are three aspects of the soul, at least, in the Kabbalah. There is the nefesh, which is the vegetative soul. There is the ruach, or otherwise translated wind or spirit, which is more of a vital, animalistic, some say emotional soul. And then there's the neshama, the uh, higher godly intellectual soul. At death, the nefesh and all three of those aspects have to go through the period of purification, Gehenna, and then they begin to separate. At that point, then the soul prepares itself for rebirth after it's gone through this process. And according to some, there are spirit guides that help it make decisions as to where it goes next, which uh, into what body it incarnates and what lessons it needs to fulfill in the next life. The study of Kabbalah reached its apex of popularity in 15th century Spain. It was here where Jewish acceptance of reincarnation became widespread. In 1492, the same year that Christopher Columbus discovered the New World for Spain, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella issued one of the most devastating proclamations ever to befall the Jews. En masse, they were expelled from Spain. Many of the Jews would flee to other parts of Europe. There, they kept their religious traditions intact, 
where they flourished for hundreds of years. But with the dawn of the modern era, mysticism and belief in reincarnation would be largely suppressed. Reincarnation in Judaism did not go underground until the early 19th century, and the movement to the West, the urge to be accepted by the more, quote, scientific, unquote, establishment in the West, and then reincarnation went underground in some circles, but not in the ultra-Orthodox or Hasidic. And many, many rabbis have called reincarnation, Gilgul, the cornerstone of Judaism. Christianity is enshrined in the books that make up the New Testament of the Bible. Do any passages within these texts hint at reincarnation? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. John 14, 1. Does the reference to many mansions refer to the many lives or the many incarnations of the soul? There are those who believe it does. Jesus himself may have been referring to his own previous incarnation in this passage from the book of John. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. John 8, 56 Three centuries after the crucifixion of Jesus, the Roman Emperor Constantine embraced Christianity declaring it the official religion of the empire. In the year 325, he convened the world's first ecumenical conference known as the Council of Nicaea. Though consolidating much of the doctrine of the newly established church, the gathering was the death knell of belief in transmigration or reincarnation among most Christians. The Christian patriarchs decided that this multi-future life idea was not very good because it was a little too loose. They would like people to feel that there was only one future life and the quality of that was determined by how well they fit in with the church's orders. And so they banned, therefore, transmigration belief, which was common in all of the Mediterranean cultures. Ever since mainstream Judaism and Christianity had suppressed the concept of reincarnation centuries ago, little credence was given to it in the West. But by the 19th century, that was about to change. The place was upstate New York, about 20 miles from Rochester. The year was 1848. The sleepy little hamlet of Hydesville was as quiet and uneventful a place as a small American town could be. However, in the home of John and Margaret Fox and their young daughters, Kate and Margaret, a series of strange events was about to unfold. Beginning around the middle of March, the family reported being disturbed by a series of strange noises. Then, on March 31st, the youngest daughter, Kate, challenged the strange unseen force. In response to the loud thumping noises that she heard, she snapped her fingers in reply. Over the next few nights, she and the mysterious entity worked out a form of communication. Then the other daughter, Margaret, began asking questions of the spirit force. If your answer is yes, knock twice. If no, knock once. And so, over a period of evenings, 
It was learned that the spirit in the house once belonged to a man who had been murdered in one of the bedrooms and buried in the cellar. When the floor of the cellar was dug up, a human skeleton was found buried there, confirming the story. Although the murderer was never found and the case remained unsolved, what the incident did was to ignite public interest in the survival of the soul after death, a fundamental tenet in belief in reincarnation. Suddenly, spiritualism and the possibility of communicating with departed souls became popular. Additional impetus behind the awakening of a belief in reincarnation came from the other side of the world, from the daughter of a Russian colonel, born Helena Hahn in the Ukraine in 1831. She, more than any other, was to challenge the conventional view that the soul does not incarnate again after death. She was born, according to her relatives, with an air of mystery. Uh, surrounding her. She would often talk about uh, uh, things that were, for the most part, mysterious to the family. They didn't quite know what she was talking about. And, and she would talk about adventures that she had that everybody knew did not happen, but with such a conviction that it was actually, uh, to her, the real thing. In her late teens, Helena Hahn married a military man more than 20 years her senior. He was General Nikifor Blavatsky. Thus it was that the simple Helena Hahn would become better known to the world as Madame Helena Blavatsky, eventually to be one of the most influential forces behind a popular rekindling of belief in reincarnation. Desperately unhappy with her marriage, Madame Blavatsky deserted her husband and immediately began traveling the world in search of adventure. Her driving quest was to investigate the religious doctrines of the East. She traveled throughout the world, including North America, Europe, uh, Egypt, the Near East, India, Tibet. The purpose of her traveling was to try to uh, find the wisdom, the ancient wisdom. And what she did was to collect this wisdom that she studied from books and from elsewhere, and she synthesized it to teach what she called the secret doctrine or the wisdom of the ages. What she claimed was that this was the primeval religion of humanity and the truth that the wisdom somehow was corrupted or lost by other religions that retained at least part of it. And what she was trying to do was to rediscover what this truth was. In 1873, Madame Blavatsky arrived in the United States and found the country in the grip of the spiritualism craze following the strange experiences of the Fox family in upstate New York. Anxious to share her mystical experiences in Egypt, Tibet, and India, and to offer insight into those cultures' belief in reincarnation, Madame Blavatsky attended a spiritualist meeting at a remote farm near Chittenden in Vermont. There she met Colonel Henry Steele Olcott. The two struck up an immediate friendship. In September 1875, Blavatsky and Olcott formed the Theosophical Society, an organization dedicated to the study of occultism, ancient religion, and the process of reincarnation. Prolific writer, expounding her beliefs in reincarnation in monumental works such as The Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled. Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott eventually moved their Theosophical Society to India, where they could be nearer to the Hindu masters from whom they wished to learn more. In 1884, they relocated to Europe. Seven years later, on May 8, 1891, Madame Blavatsky died in Surrey, England. 
What is her legacy today as one of the first Western exponents of reincarnation and the transmigration of the soul? Every single writer who speaks on reincarnation probably owes a depth of, uh, of uh, gratitude towards Blavatsky. It's Blavatsky who gives the definition of what reincarnation is. It is one of the greatest of all mysteries and one of our oldest quests. Have we lived before? And following death, do we come back and live again? One of the most compelling cases of a vivid remembrance of a past life took the world by storm in the early 50s. Colorado businessman and amateur hypnotist Maury Bernstein was popular among his friends and associates for his ability to lull people into a trance-like sleep and coax them into recalling incidents from their pasts, often even as far back as their childhoods. However, in 1952, he did not suspect that one of his subjects, Virginia Tai, would graphically recall incidents from a previous lifetime. When news leaked out that the 29-year-old mother of three was able to recall a past incarnation, Bernstein gave her the pseudonym of Ruth Simmons to preserve her identity and protect her from an increasingly curious press. Under hypnosis, the young woman identified herself as Bridie Murphy, born in the city of Cork, Ireland in 1798. These are actual recordings made during her hypnosis sessions. And what is your name? Bridie. See, why did they name you that? Well, they named me after my grandmother, Bridget, oh. I'm Bridie. Do you always live in Cork? No. Go to Belfast. You go to Belfast. Mm -hmm. What is the name of the priest? What is the name of the father? Father John. Father John. At times, while under hypnosis, Ty's voice developed an unmistakable Irish brogue. While never having traveled outside of the United States, she recalled details of her home in Ireland, her family, and the town in which she lived. When journalists investigated the area mentioned by Ty, they found her descriptions to be uncannily accurate. Shops and streets were just as she recounted them. Because thousands of people share the name Murphy in Ireland, it was impossible for them to find exact records of her and her family. Was it all a hoax? Or as many believe, did Virginia Ty genuinely recall a past life nearly two centuries earlier? I'm holding on to my brother. We, we can't find our mom. We don't know where our mom is. Today, in some circles, really techniques known as past life regression have become a legitimate recognized field of research. What have these sessions revealed? I think the great lesson for me of all of my research and studies is that we do not die when our physical bodies die. A part of us goes on. Whatever you want to call this part, consciousness, soul, spirit, it does go on. And so that we are eternal. And I believe that a famous mystic summed this up centuries ago by saying, we are not human beings here having a spiritual experience, but we are spiritual beings having a human experience. During okay. clinical death, many have described being able to view their own bodies from the outside as though they were separate entities. Some have even described what happened in the hospital room while their hearts had technically stopped beating, while they were, to all intents and purposes, dead. And they can tell you things that happened in another part of the hospital or another part of the city or another part of the world, 
and in fact it is verified. Uh, like a woman, for example, uh, at, uh, during her near-death experience, she would tell them what they were talking about when they were signing the death uh, papers. So this is one example of a scientific kind of research that may suggest continuity of consciousness after death. Despite such stories, there are those who find reincarnation impossible to accept. The reason most cited is that few, if any of us, are able to recall a previous life. Although it may seem helpful if we could remember our past lives, I think there is a very compelling reason why we do not, and that is to see if we have really learned our lessons. This is a big school, this earth, this planet in which we live. And if we behave because of reward or punishment, that wouldn't be enough. We have to see if it's really in our heart, not because we know that we've been punished for this in the 15th century or rewarded for it in the 17th century, but is it really in our heart? And of course, the other reason is it would just be too much to carry around all the time a knowledge of perhaps hundreds of past lives. We would never be able to function. We may never know the answer to what happens to us after we die until death itself claims us. If we heed the past and consider the documentation passed down through the centuries, perhaps the riddle of life after death may not be as obscure as many deem it to be. Perhaps each individual is fated to take the same awesome journey through time as the one we take in search of history.